This is the Violent Professional Podcast. Hey, you guys ever uh, you ever uh, go into your closet, you know, after a night of fun activities, uh, wake up, throw a shirt on, because you need a shirt. You can't go out and have your nipples all hanging out in public, and then realize as you're about to exit your abode, exit your humble abode, this may have been a cum rag from the previous night. It's a little bit harder to tell when you're wearing a set of overalls. That's what I always say. Now, that story is about somebody else, not me. I just wanted to know. Have you guys ever done that? I, it can't be just uh, just my friend, you know. How are you guys doing? Welcome to another episode of the Violent Professional Podcast. I'm ready to fucking go. I'm ready for another fucking episode. What's on my goddamn finger? Jeez. Um, it's been a while, kids. Last episode was my buddy Mark and I. We were talking about just whatever the fuck we were talking about. We're talking about the future. We're talking about the present. We're talking the past. We're fucking time travelers, my friends. But here we are yet again. I know the baby birds out there. You've been begging for it. Mouth agape. You've been asked for another episode. Just just like feed me. Feed me, daddy. And here we are. I'm ready to feed you. Uh, let me shut this fucking monitor off. It's distracting me. Um, I'm, I'm ready to give it to you. This is a good episode. I'm going to try a few things. Uh, talk about some new things. I'm going to try to stop touching the fucking microphone this time. Let's, it's all practice. We're all learning how to do this together, right? So here we go. You notice that there's, if you're watching the video, hopefully you are, you go on YouTube, you subscribe, uh, you go on Patreon, you subscribe, you know, there's a few things I'm trying from uh, one thing I'm going to try to do is not do it. I just didn't grab the mic. Uh, another thing I'm going to uh, try to do is not say the F bomb. I probably said it like a couple times or more since we started this. Um, just because I feel it's right. There's a progression we need to take in doing these episodes, and that's one of them. You know, uh, you may have noticed that the mullet's gone, but the overalls have appeared. That's fucking odd. Um, it feels like those those go together, the mullet and the overalls. They should be going together, but uh, uh, alas, they're not. Uh, but if you saw me a few weeks ago, you would have noticed that I had the overalls and the mullet, and it was popping. It was popping on the handstand. Um. You know, I want to talk about a few things that have been going on since uh, the last episode I did by myself. You know, I was up in Washington for, on vacation for a little bit, seeing uh, seeing some people. Back to my uh, my previous uh, house that I actually own, and I was taking care of that, fixing some fixing some uh, things inside of it. And on the outside of it, there was like a fence that blew over. So I was taking care of that, fixing that place up. And, uh, and then I drove back across the United States yet again. That sure was fun. Did it twice in short succession. It was not a good time, especially the second time. So the first time we went across, I had my son. We were driving across. We camped in, in Moab. We uh, had a blasty blast. We went across the United States. He saw, he saw this place, you know, Purple Mountain's Majesty. He saw all that stuff. He had a good time. It melted my little little uh, heart when he told me, he was like, this is a great trip. I felt good about that, you know, and I'd like to report to you that he said that to me. You don't win that much as a dad, I think, sometimes, but I won that time, and it felt great. Although there was a few times that I drive, you know, I got pretty pissed off at, like, drivers and stuff, and then I felt like I lost. So, overall, we'll call it a fucking, you know, let's call it even, all right? Had a good trip. Went across, and then I drove back. You know, on the last episode of the podcast, you can't really tell. You can't see the see the particulate floating around in the uh, the atmosphere. But I was catching COVID from my buddy Mark, son of a bitch, had had that disease and he gave it to me and it fucking blew dicks. Um, I think I would have been okay with it, but um, you know, I had to dri- I was driving and I found out that I had it, and uh, and it sucked. There was a period of time when I had to just keep driving and driving, only stopping for gas. Um, had to drive at one period. It was 18 and a half hours or so. I, I lost track of time. I feel like I slept into another dimension. Um, you know, there was nothing but snow at one point. I was, I was, I was on the, the leading edge of a fucking snowstorm that wouldn't quit. It just kept following me, putting a nice little blanket of winter wonderland in my path. And I just didn't know what the, when the fuck it was going to stop. There were plenty of times where I was like, I should stop and get this hotel right there, but then will I get stuck in the middle of fucking wherever? Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of wherever in the United States that you don't want to get stuck at because you may never leave. People will be missing you, you know, and they won't know where to find you because you're in whatever town USA. Uh, so I had to keep going. 
I just had to keep keep my uh, my my truck just pushing. Uh, you know, with those, I had to keep those ponies ponies going, and then uh, we made it through. But 18 hours later, I got to sleep at a truck stop in my truck for about three hours, and then continued on my way. It was probably the most miserable fucking road trip I've ever been on. One, I had COVID, and two. I was not getting stuck in some goddamn snowstorm, and so I had to push. And it was basically the like, let's take out those three hours of sleep, which don't count for Jack and shit. Me with COVID, I drove from Boise back to Arkansas with the exception of three hours of sleep. It fucking sucked. That's that's well over <laughs> twenty four hours of straight driving, with a little break here and there to get some gas. I was at, if I if I could tell you I was exhausted. That would be be beyond the truth. Beyond the truth is more truth than truth, which is absolutely fucking amazing. Let me get a little sip of this. I got to stay hydrated for you. Maybe you've heard me in the past where on this podcast, I'm not so hydrated. Maybe I had a few cold cores light, a little too many for fucking 200 days straight. And I was like, ah, so I got to stay hydrated. You get, don't take that from me. You know, the world will take so much from you. Don't take my hydration, all right? I got a little bit of juice in there. No booze in there. I'm clean, all right? I I have been on this kick of no alcohol since I left Washington. I feel amazing, you know? Uh, you know, some people ask me, like, hey, why you, is, do you feel like you're going overboard? So to some respect, I'll, I'll admit yes. But I will say that one uh, re- real reason I was driving... I'm not an alcoholic that drives and drinks across the United States. Are you fucking kidding me? If I'm in like a hotel, maybe I'll have one or two. But I didn't even do that. I stopped at one fucking hotel in Boise. And from Boise, I just drove. Um, But aside from that, I had COVID. I didn't feel like it would be a good idea to uh, necessarily drink while I had it. I'd give myself a good shot at surviving it, you know. Um. Anyway, this, I'm not going to talk about what it was like. I mean... You all had it. Who gives a shit? Um, but what I will say is that when I got back, I was extremely exhausted, as you could imagine. Um, and uh, and I slept for eternity, and here we are. I just woke up, ready to podcast after about fucking three weeks of being in my eternal slumber. Um, in that period of time, you may be wondering, well, what have you been doing with yourself, Mike? What have you been doing to keep yourself occupied? I haven't been working. I've just been, you know, doing some administrative stuff, working on the format for the podcast, trying to give some of the patrons and some of the listeners and some of you guys are just finding out about us a a new podcast experience with the Violent Professional Podcast. Good Lord, we know we need it. So, (laughs) so anyway, I I was like, let me look back at what what the people like, give the people what they want. You guys, guys and girls seem to like the, uh, get out of here, Zia. You, you guys and girls seem to like, um, the macabre, dark and mysterious, you know, the, the creepy, the crawly to the window, to the wally. You like that kind of stuff. So, um, I decided this next year, I'm going to try to bring my sense of humor into some of this really gruesome, dark stuff that um i'm interested in you know i like abandoned buildings although i don't go in them by myself because that is uh that is a death sentence ghosts they don't fuck around so to speak so um i will uh i will you know research some stories i you know today i put in last night i wrote the format based on a previous format the uh space monkey series i believe i owe you a space monkey three but that's not today. This is a different story. Um, I took the previous, the format of Space Monkey, and now I'm gonna apply it to uh, f- future episodes. We'll see how it goes. You know, you gotta have a little bit of structure in the beginning of this fucking shit show. Really, no structure that to be seen or heard of. But I'm gonna try to do better this year. I think you guys deserve it. You've been you've been great to me. You've been listening to episodes, re-listening to episodes, just waiting, just waiting. The uh, listenership is doing okay. Uh, and no, no, it's doing great. You know, I, I appreciate every single listener. I also haven't been putting out any episodes, as you probably know. But, I again, I'm going to do better for you guys and girls. 
Guys and girls. I'm just going to keep saying that. I'm going to try to do better for you guys. Um, and it starts today. So you might be asking yourself, Mike, what the fuck you been doing, dude? You just been sitting on your tuchus? You been resting on your laurels? Uh, you been getting all fat and sassy? Now, all those things are true, but uh, one of the thing in particular, I decided it would be a great idea to uh, you know put some online school on my plate. You may have I've seen in some of my content I've been talking about. I'm going to become a fucking uh, science. I'm getting my science degree. Well, that's partially true. I'm taking chemistry, English, and fucking my fucking calculus because apparently they think I'm smart or some shit. When I <laughs> I, so I, I went, I, I, there's a community college near my house in Washington and I fucking signed up because I am a veteran and you get the GI bill and they pay you. I was like, that'd be nice to get a little fucking kickback from my time in service. Plus I'll go to school and learn some, you know? So I went in there with no focus. I have some, I have some schooling previously, you know, I was going for information systems technology, but I, I was like, I mean, I ain't no nerd. All right. I know nothing about information systems or technology. Um, so I just went in there and I was like, Hey, I want to take full-time classes. Uh, and, and I use some of my benefits from my time of service. That's great. And they'll give me a little kickback. I help out with some of my bills, you know? And so I'll try my best and I'll make my mama proud. I'll be, I'll go to school and I'll be not the first graduate of my family, but I'll graduate something. Maybe I won't, and especially after taking these fucking classes. I don't want to graduate shit. I don't even want to continue. I want to fucking quit right now. So anyway, I turned in my transcripts from previous schooling that I've had from previous college. You may not know it, but I'm a fucking, I'm a fucking uh, intellectual, right? But I turned in my transcripts and they gave me fucking calculus. They gave me fucking chemistry and they gave me goddamn English. I don't want to do any of those things. I want to be the next Neil deGrasse Tyson, but the white version. Now, he might be both. I don't know. I want to be a fucking astrophysicist. I think. I just, I don't really, you know, I, I much prefer the title, uh, not so much the work to get there. So I probably should have printed something off the internet. This is the PowerPoint certificate. But anyway. So I t- they put me in these classes and I was like, this is a mistake. I went to the fucking advisor. I was like, hey, um, I think you guys made a, a fucking strategic error with this. And like, oh, why is that? And I say, because I'm a dummy. I need to take like, like arithmetic. Like <laughs> I need to take math, which doesn't involve a calculator and some fucking graphing and all this other shit. That's that people quit school over. Um, and as far as chemistry, what we talking about here, you know, I go, oh, you're on fucking level, whatever. So anyway, it's not one oh one. I'll tell you that much. Um, anyway, I get into school and, I get into my school and I'm just not having a good time. First week, great. It's syllabus quizzes. I can fucking learn stuff. I can be like, this is, uh, you know, we're talking about what we're going to be doing. And I got, I fucking aced it, man. I fucking took the first quizzes, fucking aced them. But week two came. And, and you want to know the heart, the fucking weirdest thing? It ain't the math and it ain't the chemistry that's getting me. It's the fucking English, oddly, oddly enough. And you know why my grade is suffering? To a fucking, I'm not even, I don't even think I'm passing right now. It's because I hate participating in forums with these fucking 16 year old running start students that are smart as fuck. I asked them questions in the forum and I'm like, Hey, how do you do this math problem? And they tell me, and I'm like, I still don't understand you smarty pants. I'm having, I'm having, I'm struggling. it's like the, I didn't go in with good intentions, right? I went in and be like, you know, I'll, I'll take the benefit and then maybe I'll pass, you know? I didn't go in with good intentions, and this is what I get. I get a, a struggle. It's a rough. Anyway, that's been my past few weeks. I hope you enjoyed my tale of woe. But it's nothing compared to what we're going to get into right now. And I will... I have prepared for this episode. It's dark. It's dark and dingy, and it is bloody. I'll tell you that much. So today... And if I could pull up my notes, because I need them. God knows I, God knows I need them. Hey, while we wait for me to pull this up, if you could, Spotify has a new rating system. 
If you can go on there, tap the three. You're listening to this on Spotify? There's three buttons next to my fucking artwork with the little death cheetah, and it says The Violent Professional. If you can go on Spotify um, and, uh, you know, hit the three buttons below that, and then it says rate. If you could give us a five-star rating, that'd be huge. It fucking, it light up my life. Truly, because, uh, you know, when when you're uh, a podcast, you need all the help you can get, you know, to get the word out that people want to listen. I know some of you want to listen, so if you like the episodes, if you like the podcast, um, then could you tell people about us? Like, share the fucking the podcast, the Instagram, what have you, the website. But give us a rating on uh, Spotify. That will help immensely. So tonight, I'm going to talk about the visca... Vis- Villisca, Villisca Axe Murders. This is uh, something that is a part of lost American history that was pre- preceded major serial killers, modern serial killers of the day. And I'm not talking about like the ones that are like very recent. I'm talking about like the 80s and 90s and 70s, right? Uh, Dahmer, we're talking the Zodiac Killer. We're talking about, uh, you know, the Manson family, stuff like that. This is before this, way before all that. I'm going to try, this name is, this, the name of the town is going to escape me a few times, I'm sure of it, but I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to do it right, okay? The Velisca Axe Murders occurred between the evening of June 9th, 1912 and the early morning of June 10th, 1912. Uh, in the town of Velisca, Iowa. Yeah, some of you have never heard of this, so I'm going to fill you in, all right? I have never heard about this until I started going, like, what am I going to talk about this week? What am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about some fucked up shit? Yeah, I'll talk about this. Um, in the v- Velisca Axe Murders, six members of um, the family known as Moore and two guests were beat to death, slashed, hacked, and smashed uh, in somewhere in the, the morning of June 9th and June 10th after they all went to sleep. Um, of the eight victims, six of them were children, unfortunately. Again, this happened a while ago. So um, this is before cell phones, modern shit. This is uh this is as American as you can get when it comes to uh, mass murders, and um and jumping ahead you can go visit this place. It's in Iowa. It's actually like a tour. It's pretty fucked up. The uh, the building's still there. You can go in all the rooms, but getting into it. So during the nighttime, eight people were murdered in a really f- fucking weird way, and this this is unsolved it's still to this day is unsolved they don't know who it is they've got a few they have a few uh uh suspects but nobody's been uh convicted of this a few people went to trial there's about four people that were suspects and uh one of them was their best shot but then he everybody the the jury was hung they couldn't uh figure it out after even confessions from and i'll 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 only talk about the one that i feel is the one out of all all of them, I'll, I'll talk about the one what I that I feel is the most probable. So it's either a person or persons, but highly likely that it's one person um, entered their house in in Iowa, and um, in the nighttime walked through and one by one systematically executed everybody in the house. There were two adults. Six kids, uh, and of the six kids, they were between the ages of five and 12. And um, over 10 years of investigation, uh, repeated grand jury hearings, and uh, four suspects, they could never convict anybody because it was so, there was not enough evidence, and I'll tell you why. The evidence got all fucked up uh, after the the family was discovered. So, uh there's the father Josiah uh, Moore and his wife Sarah took their four children, Herman, Catherine, Boyd, and Paul, to uh, a children's day service at their Presbyterian church. Uh, with them were Lena and Ina Stillinger, Stillinger, who were neighborhood uh, kids and friends with them, and they were at the service with the the family. 
and at the conclusion of the ceremony, they their parents were away and uh, the kids wanted to sleep over with their friends. So they went back to their house. Oh, well, let me go back. Um, talking about the service, it was the end of end of your Sunday school program. Uh, the mother was the co-director and all the kids performed little speeches and recitations along with other uh, Sunday school members. Um, at the end of the service, there was a little uh, hangout session with all the kids. And you, like if you've ever been to uh, church, uh, depending on what church you go to, sometimes like the one I went through was a Protestant or Christian or Catholic um, my family and my extended relatives, we all like had different, different, uh, churches we all went to. So it was always kind of similar, but a little bit different, especially with the Catholic stuff. If you ever been to that, it's a little bit different. So usually the, at the, at the end of Sunday school or whatever, which is what I enjoyed as a kid is like the coffee cake and the donuts and stuff that they had at the church. If you had that, that's, that was something I enjoyed. There was literally, uh, the only thing that I enjoyed about it. Um, so now I just get cake like on Saturdays. So, so it, it, the whole thing ended at nine thirty PM on uh, June 9th of 1912. It's a long time ago. It's over a hundred years ago. Um, and so everybody left the congregation the se- the the end of year celebration and um all the family and the two other guests they they walked with them back to the Moore house and then they had some cookies and milk having some fun family shit and they uh they you know the parents tucked everybody in everybody went to sleep and then uh the parents went to sleep and so somewhere they it, it, after everybody went to sleep, they would never wake up again. So the next day comes and the people are outside. Uh, let me find this lady's name. So the next, uh, this lady named Mary Peckham, she was a neighbor of the Moors. And it was about 7.30 a.m. when Mary realized that nobody was outside. See, back then... Kids and family members were usually up. They were taking care of their fucking livestock or their chickens, who the the Moors had chickens. They were doing laundry. And there was just, you could tell there was commotion. People were making breakfast, all that stuff. It's a different time. You would wake up early. Everybody was up and everybody was doing their thing. Kids were running around. And so she noticed by 730 that none of the kids, none of the family was up. There was no sound coming from the Moore house. And so she went to go see what was going on, see if everything was all right. And she knocked on the door. Nobody answered. It was dead quiet. And she tried to open the door, uh, the front door to the house. I'll explain how the house is laid out, too. Um, And uh, nothing. The doors are locked. She can't get in. And so she called her. uh, Who would she call? She called uh, her brother or Joe's brother, Ross, who had a key to the house. And he came over and. um, And um, he arrived about eight. Um. And um, he had an extra key, and so he went and uh, opened the door, unlocked the door, went inside, and quickly realized that everybody in the house was dead. So he went in, saw two people dead, and he backed out, and they called the the sheriff or the constable. Um, what he saw was two figures covered in, a, in sheets in the back bedroom, which would be the downstairs. As you walk into the kitchen, you go through the, what they, what is called the parlor or the living room, take a right. There's a bedroom right there and kids were covered up with, uh, with, uh, their bloody rags. So he stepped back. He, uh, got out of the house. Cause he was like, Oh shit. I don't know what the fuck's happening. And he backed up, called the police. The police showed up. And, um, but the, uh, as the uh, the cops got there and started looking at stuff, at some point along the way, and I'm not certain when, they went into town, I think to the drugstore for some reason, and then they the, the officer mentioned it and everybody in town heard. So in between the time that the, the police were there and the coroner were there, um, the 
everybody in the town, about 2,000 people, they all ran to the house and they just mobbed the house and they went in to go see because it, you got to understand these small towns, like 2,000 people, everybody knew each other. And so that everybody heard that the Moore family had been murdered. And so they all just ran the house and they were going one by one, but to each room and police showed up again, pushed everybody out. Um, so the coroner could come in and they were just trampling all over the crime scene. Now to go back and talk about what happened, because I feel like I did this out of order, but here we go. I'm trying, I'm trying to do something new. Essentially what happened was somewhere in the, in the, the, the dark of night. And at the end of this, you're probably going to lock your fucking doors. You should lock your doors. Anyway, you should double check your doors every single fucking night. It's kind of silly to leave your doors open in case this shit happens around you. But what I'm saying is, uh, first check your doors right now, go do it, pause this and then go check it. But what happened was I'll use my little map. So somewhere along the line, someone or two or more than one person entered the house, but likely it's one person. They were in the house and as you walk in the house from the downstairs, which the idea, which the, they think happened is that, uh, Joe Moore's Josiah Moore's ax was in the backyard. And as this person, whoever it was came through the back fr- near the chicken coops, chicken coops are a little bit further out from the, the back porch kind of, um, he grabbed Josiah's ax out of like the shed or the, like the fucking, uh, near the chicken coop and walked in the house, which was unlocked back in the day. Nobody, re- this stuff wasn't really happening. So there was no real locking of the doors. They had latches. Nobody was really concerned about this kind of stuff. And so you see what happens, right? This person enters the house and what they initially thought, and I'll tell you what's more than likely to have happened after I looked at a bunch of videos and read a bunch of stuff, um, entered through the house and went right up the stairs. So right there to the parents, uh, room, which was at the top of the stairs straight. As you come up the stairs in the house, you enter the kitchen and there's multiple doorways straight ahead is the, the living room. And to the right on that side is a blue room which is where the two guest children were sleeping. Didn't go there, walked right past them. Uh, to the right of that door in the kitchen is a set of stairs that go kind of go like make a S shape. So they go to the right, go up, or go go to the right, go back, and then up and across at the top of the stair landing is uh, the bed of the parents. To the left of that is a a bedroom where three children were sleeping, but right at the top of the stairs, Josiah and his wife were sitting there. The person that killed them, everybody in the house, uh, proceeded to smash uh, the father with the back end of the blade of the ax. Um, and then use the blade and chop him up in the, in the head. So in the actual house behind where he would be standing, the, the, the flat edge of the ax is, you can see it smashed in the wall. There's a big mark. And so the idea is that what happened was he had the ax as he's coming down and chopping the shit out of Josiah. He smashed the wall and it's crazy because it's still in the wall, this big bash section, which looks exactly like the back of a, if you ever seen an ax, it's flat, it's like long. And it looks exactly like that. Like he was going back and then smash. So he chops him up and then he smashes his wife with the ax. So he flipped the the axe around and smashed her with the in the head with the back in the blunt edge of the the axe. Uh, the only person he used to cut up with the blade edge was Josiah. So right there is kind of what the investigators think is that this person that was in the house doing this knew them or knew Josiah and had some beef with him or something else. I'll give you an idea about what I think after researching this of what I think the motivation was. So he goes from there after he kills the parents, he walks behind the children are still sleeping. Right. And he one by one whacks them with the back end and it's immediately to the head and kills them instantly. Um, there's only one of them that was awake when this happened, supposedly. And he's going around and, and smashing them. Uh, and then he, proceeds to go back to the parents room and takes more swings at Josiah. So essentially everybody was just once or twice, 
but the mother was a whole bunch. I think it was 20 times. And then Josiah was like way more than that to a point of disfigurement. So you can even tell who the, who he was from the top of his jaw up was flattened, flattened and hacked and just disfigured into an unbelievably gruesome mud, uh, messed up way. All right. So from there he goes downstairs and hears there's children in the other room and he takes them out too. Now, one of them, some of this stuff I don't want to talk about because it's pretty fucking twisted and there has to do with uh, sexual assault, whatever. But, and it, it doesn't really matter. That's just kind of like par for the course with this kind of thing. So supposedly he uh, did something really bad to uh, one or multiple of the kids. But um, before that, he hit one of the kids with the back end of the, the ax again and then went to the other kid and the in in the investigation and the, when the coroner was there there's blade there's blade cut marks on the forearms of one of them and so it shows that there was somebody that was uh defending themselves in the house truly unfortunate story um it's pretty fucked up not pretty fucked up it's really fucked up it's like when i was doing this i was like well i'm gonna start doing these weird stories that are kind of messed up or dark or whatever but just if you've ever like sat there and listened to this kind of stuff, like it's, it's pretty hard to listen to some of the stuff. And even in, uh, back in the day when that was happening, like back in the day, that was like over a hundred years ago. It's still hard to listen to because you could imagine, especially like if you get balls deep in these stories, you put yourself in it and you're just like reading, researching. And so you, so now you have to understand what was happening during that and put yourself in that. So then also, the layout layout of the house kind of comes into play with this. So whoever this person was, uh, the initial thought is they came in through the backyard, but then there's a, there's another theory on this that they were most likely in the attic the whole time when the parents were out at the, uh, their, uh, end of year, uh, religious uh, celebration they were having with their family. It's like a big family event, right? So as you go into the house from the back where they, they initially thought you walk into the kitchen and so you walk into the kitchen across the, their little deck. And I think that might be added on since they made it like a museum, you walk into the kitchen and, and as you look forward, there's all kitchen shit from old timey kitchen shit, but right across on the right corner is the entryway to the parlor. Now in the parlor, there's, old wood burning stove and before that to the right there's a uh, a room where the two guests were staying now and there's there's one bed and they were both in it um now back out there go to the kitchen again there's a pantry to the right and then the stairway that goes up makes that kind of s turn and then up which is at the top of the flight of stairs would be the bed straight across which was the end of the bed was right here and then to the left was where that ax mark was in the, in like, kind of like the, the rooms were like, because they were like old houses and they were smaller. They had the, the apex of the roof. You could see the, uh, what's it called? The, uh, the slope of the roof through the walls. So at the head of the bed, there was that slope. And then to the left, there was a wall with the dresser and you can see the mark, the mark in the wall clearly it is where the ax hit as he was bringing it down on Josiah. Now, um, where the killer would be to the right would be an attic crawl space. And so when they did their investigation, when they came in, there was also in the attic space, there was a chair and there were two, uh, completely smoked cigarettes that were on the ground. So what the other theory is that the guy was in the house the whole time he's in the attic. And when the doorway to the attic is, it doesn't make any sound at least now. So it would make sense that the person would be sitting there. He would walk up and he'd already be in the house, especially with the, uh, the fact that the doors don't lock. They didn't have any locked doors back then. So soundless door comes in, has the ax already that he picked up from the backyard who the ax was Josiah's. And he went over and started, uh, one by one, taking everybody out. Um, so as the dude walked out of the attic, to the left is the kids room to the front is the father and mother. And then downstairs through the kitchen, through the living room to the right would be the last room where he took every, the rest of them out. Uh, multiple times went back upstairs to take, take, uh, take care of 
uh, more care of the uh, father and the mother and then continue on his way wherever the fuck he went. So um, all the victims were found in their beds. They were covered with uh, bed cloth, which I think is probably their sheets. Um, the, the upstairs was covered with plaster in one of the beds because when he struck the roof, there's plaster all over the floor. And then, um, and then like the mirrors, the mirrors and the windows were all covered. Now there's some videos out there where they talk about how the, why were the mirrors covered? Why did he cover them up with sheets and all that stuff? And they say like, Oh, they, they get super sti- These kind of people get superstitious about that kind of stuff. Um, and while that is partially true, it mostly goes into a religious background. And this is where I'm getting into who I think, um, did it. So there are multiple, um, multiple, uh, suspects in this whole thing. One was, they were all mentally, uh, the mentally deranged. One was the, I believe he was the governor or the, a Senator from, um, Iowa who, um, he had like conflict with Josiah, Um, and, uh, but more than likely it was someone that knew the family, um, and, uh, knew the layout of the house is what I feel. So, um, the mirrors were all covered up and this is, it's not like necessarily a, a, um, superstitious thing. It's more of a religious thing that happens. And you see this, like, even in Abraham Lincoln's funeral, when he was, when they were doing the wake and all that stuff, they cover up mirrors and it's a religious uh, it's kind of like a ritual in religious in religions across the entire world. They cover up mirrors as a sign of respect. There's some thought that like the, the soul will get trapped in the mirror or the soul will see its body and get freaked out, stuff like that. Um, so that's really why they do it. And I guess you could say that's superstition, but, or, but a lot of the, a lot of the people that talk about it, they think about like, well, they don't want to look at themselves when they know they're doing something bad. And that's not necessarily it. It's mostly a religious thing. It's uh, And so this leads me to believe this was like a religious type. Now, a lot of people were religious back then, but the uh, the person I think did it based on all of the stuff I read was a, and he was, he was not convicted, although he did confess a whole bunch a few times. I'm going to shut my sound off. It's the ghosts trying to tell me to shut the fuck up. So, um, so this is a horrific, horrific crime scene. Let me go back before I start talking about who I think did it and why. And I wrote down that stuff so I could just talk about it. Um, so as the, the coroner gets there to do the investigation, like the crime scene's completely fucked up. It's completely fucked up. Everything's in disarray because, of, like I said, all those people are just running through the fucking house. Everybody's running through the house, looking at the bodies. Like, it's a fucking show. You would never see that shit the, like nowadays. People would be like, stay away from there. Let the cops do their job. Um, but no, they went through and just dismantled the whole fucking crime scene. Totally unheard of again. So when they go through there, they see a bunch of things that were not affected. Obviously, there's blood everywhere. Um, but one of the things was a slab of bacon, which is, if you if you don't know what a slab of bacon, I'm here to inform you, it's just uncut bacon. So he had four-pound slab of bacon. There were stories that the dude was fucking it. After, like, he, took, he wrapped it in a cloth and was fucking it. Uh, one of the things I read, he was using it as a pretend vagina. But... Uh, who, who knows? He might have meant to take it on his way out, left it there. Um, he did clean the axe, left it there, and then uh, moseyed out of there. So they saw uh, they saw a bowl of filled with water and blood, bacon, um, and then you know the axe was clean and he left it. They didn't have fingerprint technology back then, so that would have helped a lot, obviously. Um, and so all the mirrors, all the windows were covered up. It was late as fuck. Like there's only lanterns back then, so I it was way easier to get get away with this kind of shit back then. So 
Now at seven thirty was when um, what's her fucking face? Seven thirty was when they were discovered that, or eight o'clock was when they were discovered that this that this family was murdered. But before that, at about five thirty, and this will be really all you need to know. But they say that this dude it was not convicted and he died. Like whoever was involved is dead at this point. So at five around five thirty in the morning, following the murders. A man by the name of George Jacqueline Kelly. He was a reverend that came from England years ago, years prior to this, um, who had a mental uh, mental disorders and and would like look in window in windows of young women, stuff like that. Um, so. He arrived in town in Villisca for the first time the Sunday morning of the murders and attended the Sunday school performance by the Stillinger girls before departing early Monday. And then returned two weeks later and posing as a detective joined a tour of the murder house with a group of investigators. Right there, that's pretty much damning evidence, right? But it could just be interesting, interested in it. Authorities first became interested in Reverend Kelly a few weeks after the murders. See, this is the problem. Like they didn't have any, they they're out of the four people. They didn't have any, um, they didn't have any suspects and some for years. Like one of them was two years after attached to, uh, the, the Senator or the governor. And, um, he was, he had been convicted of, or not convicted. He, well, I mean, no, he wasn't convicted, but he was suspected of murdering his family with an axe in the same manner. So, like, a lot of the people they suspected were very similar. Like, they were convicted killers that had axe murders, and they were released from prison or whatever was going on. And um, they just suspected them because because they were axe murderers. So, which was a pretty common thing back then. That was, like, the, the motherfucking choice of, of murder weapon back then. You, uh, there's uh, that show with... Um, Mike Myers or that movie, Mike Myers. So I married an ax, married an ax murder. It was like a comedy. Um, it's pretty good back in the eighties or nineties, whatever the fuck it was probably nineties. So, um, the morning of the murder it was noted when they actually made the Reverend or they, they said that, Oh, now you're a suspect to the Reverend. It's noted the Monday, the, the, the morning after he was talking about it to people on the train on an on a early morning train before anybody knew they were murdered. He was saying there's eight, eight murdered souls back in, uh, Villisca and, um, and talked about the kids and stuff like that. So, right, I mean, right there, like that's, that's enough, right? And on uh, August 13th, 31st, this had to be, when was this? August 31st. So in August, by August 31st at 7 a.m., Kelly signed a confession to the murder saying God had whispered to him to suffer the children to come unto me. Kelly recanted his confession at trial. Uh, and his case went to the jury on September 26th. Jury was deadlocked and no one else was ever been tried for the murders and the crime remains. One of the most horrific unsolved mass murders in American history. So that that's something you may not have known. If you want to go research it, it's pretty interesting. Um, this is my first crack at doing this kind of stuff. I'm not really great at it. I'll, I'll admit this wasn't one of my better, better, uh, cracks at fucking <laughs> this kind of stuff. You know, um, but I tried. There's a lot more to this story. It, uh, but it's it's one that I think is interesting. This is the uh, one of the first mass murders that was never solved. My gut tells me that it, after research and learning about us, it's Kelly. He was a weirdo. He he like looked at like I said. He looked in people's windows, went around, fucking had a screw loose, and um. But he was a he was a preacher at a Methodist church across North Dakota, Minnesota, Kansas, and Iowa. He was assigned a uh, visiting minister to several small communities north of Villisca, where he developed a reputation for odd behavior. 
He also had been convicted of sending obscene materials through the mail and had been spent time in a mental institution. So there you go. I think it was the uh, Reverend. There's other people that were associated with it, but like the rest of them is just coincidental acts, murders, whatever. So anyway, thank you for checking out this episode. I truly appreciate it. I know it's a short one and I know you usually uh, expect a, a full hour, but we're, here we are at 45 minutes and it's okay. We'll be all right. We'll be fine. We'll do more of these. I just wanted to, tr- I just wanted to dip my toe into the, the creepy shit uh, yet again. We've done some before. I think what, uh, you know, let me know what, what you'd like me to cover. Um, and this could be internet rabbit holes. Those kind of like, those are wacky though. Like th- this, honestly, this shit's easier to do than do fucking inter- internet rabbit holes. That gets fucking weird. If you, if you saw the L F H O Q, however the fuck you say L H O H Q stuff, really popular episode that me and Mark did. Uh, that is a challenge. Cause now you're getting into like, I, I'm going to fucking look at this, but I may be brainwashed by the end of it. And I might start a cult. Or sacrifice myself or other people. I maybe could become this shit. I may go fucking axe murder some people. Um, those are really challenging to do. Um, and it takes a long time to be like to to try to go down those holes, those rabbit holes. Try to walk those roads and not get lost and see some fucked up shit. Those are challenging, but I'll do them if you want me to. Uh just you know, don't 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 threaten me with a good time. I'll try it. But I'm gonna do I'm going to do more of these. I know you guys like them. And so I, I'm a man of the people. I'll give you what you want. Uh, if you do support this podcast again, please go subscribe on any of this stuff. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notifications, wherever you may be and give us a rating on all of our platforms out there, especially Spotify. Um, especially right now. We gosh knows we can use it. We use those, uh, up ratings and we can use a five star rating. So if, if you're not a dick, and you don't just come on here to fuck with me and put a one star, please give me a five star rating. It would be very appreciated. And with that, kids, we'll see you next time on the next episode of the Bomb Professional Podcast. See ya.